Okay, let's turn in Proverbs. Man, we're coming to the end of it. We're going to get to chapter 31, verse 9 tonight. And then next week, we're going to do the Proverbs woman, the Proverbs 31 woman, and then we will be done. Listen, some of you made note of when we started. How long have we been in the... I looked up the other day, and there's like 70 studies on the, on the book of Proverbs. It's, been the, it took, it's taken us longer to get through Proverbs than Genesis. Can you imagine? And so we're going we're gonna to get through the rest of chapter 30 on into halfway through chapter 31 tonight, and then we'll finish it up. And by the way, when we're done, we're going to do the book of Ruth. That's the next book. And then Daniel. Because Daniel will tie in as we're moving our way on Sunday mornings through Revelation. There's a lot of information in Daniel, and we'll bring in as we're going through Daniel some of the other prophets like Zechariah and Isaiah. And it'll kind of make a complete package for us as we're going through Revelation to have this on Wednesday night as an aside uh, to that. Because we're kind of studying prophecy, eschatology on Sunday morning. It'd be good to fill in the blanks going through Daniel on Wednesday night. Did you say amen? Proverbs. Turn there with me. Chapter 30, we've come as far as verse 20. That's where I'll pick up tonight. What a verse to start with. But I've got a lot to say about that, and there's a great warning in it. So as you're turning there, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And just again, this is the book of wisdom. It is the book that has had more of an impact on my life over the years of just having that practice of reading the chapter of the day. I'm just allowing the wisdom of Solomon as he puts pen to paper under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit just to wash over my mind and, and over my heart. And Lord, I found all of these many years, over 40 of doing this, that there's not, there is not an issue that I'll ever face in this life that is not covered in the book of Proverbs. It gives me wisdom and insight, direction and understanding in every scenario and situation that will come my way just by looking at these over 350 Proverbs. So, Lord, as we just kind of finish out that section tonight, um, and then next week as we look at what the Proverbs 31 woman, wife, looks like, then, Lord, just put a great big period on Proverbs and help us to move on. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you remember last week as we entered into chapter 30, we were introduced to another writer, not Solomon. This is Agur. And I love the way Agur introduces himself because I feel a lot like Agur sometimes, and so do you. Agur says, as we opened up chapter 30 in verse 1, he said, the words of Agur, the son of Jekai, even the prophecy that the man spake unto Ithiel, even Ithiel and Yukol, who names these people these names? Are you kidding me? You know, he said, surely I am more brutish. I am more senseless. I am more ignorant. I am more stupid. I am more dense. All of those words can be interpreted from that Hebrew word. Surely I am more dense than any man, and I have not the understanding of a man. And then he's going to begin to tell us about the wisdom that God can give. He, he starts out by saying that because what he's communicating is the wisdom that he has is not natural. It's not human. You know, the Bible says in the New Testament that the natural man does not understand the things of God. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But because we're born of the Spirit and we have the Spirit of God, we understand all things. Agur is simply saying the wisdom that he's going to lay out, and he has a lot of wisdom in the short little verses that he adds to the book of Proverbs. There's a great amount of wisdom. We're going to get some more of that tonight. But he's, he is equating all of his wisdom, and he's ascribing it to the Lord. And listen, everything that we know that has any deep and lasting meaning, it comes from the Lord. Amen? And so here's Agur. And Agur says in chapter 20, listen carefully, such is the way of any adulterous woman. C can I have you do something? And listen, I'm not adding to the word. Well, I'm not adding to the word. But you could circle woman and you can put a line over there and put man. There are many men that are predators. There are women that are predators. But he's going to talk about predators. There are predators. And one of the things we like to do in this church, if there's a single gal, we watch for her. Sometimes these predators will slip in and they'll try to 
come alongside some of the single gals in our church and get with them before we can run them, as it were, through the gauntlet of the elders. But we like to watch because there are predators out there that will sneak in, both men and women. And they don't come in with the, the best of motives. Listen carefully to what he says here. Such is the way of an adulterous woman, or you can put man down there. She eateth, and the idea is to devour, to consume. She eateth, and then she wipes her mouth, and she saith, I have done no wickedness. There are people in this world that we need to be aware of. The warning of Agar, and listen, as we went through the first nine chapters of the Proverbs, it is Solomon warning his son about the same issues. We have to understand, especially in the time we're living in, there are predators that will prey on women. There are predators that will prey on men. And we have to be acutely aware of those things. I love what Solomon told to his son back in Proverbs chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, as he deals with this same issue of these women who will come along and try to steal away your heart and to lead you into sin. In fact, we're going to see as we get into the first part of chapter 31 that Solomon has some difficulty with this very issue. In Proverbs chapter 7, starting in verse 24, it says this, Hearken unto me, now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Um, there's another proverb that talks about as he's watching, wisdom is watching from a distance, this young man as he's making his way through the highways and byways of a certain city, and he sees, as it were, a prostitute waiting for him. And she engages him, and he says, he was led like a dumb ox to the slaughter. So the warning is, be careful. Not everybody that comes alongside you has the best of intentions. And there are some people that have no conscience whatsoever about destroying other people's lives. And so there's a warning there that Agar brings to us. He said, listen, and it's man or woman, but it would seem in this particular culture, the, the seductresses were more female. Nowadays, everything is <laughs> moved around, man. We don't even know what bathroom to attend anymore in our time and culture. We don't know if it's a he, she, she, he, or an it. I mean, so it can go all the way around. I know they can edit this, or I'll just, I just probably got kicked off YouTube. And so we'll be, we'll be in YouTube jail. But hey, verse 21. I, I love the way this guy writes. Over the years, I've just, listen carefully. For there are three things that the earth is disquieted. Uh, there's three things, he says, that bring disturbance into the earth and into your life, and four which you cannot bear. And the fourth one is just overwhelming. The first one, he says, is a servant when he reigneth. A servant when he reigneth. And the idea is, here, is a person that finds himself in a position of authority that is not qualified to be there. Uh, have we seen any of that lately? A person that has been elevated to a position of authority that is not qualified to be there. He said that disquiets the earth. Ah, I would have to agree. I don't want to get kicked out of Facebook too, so I'm not going to make any mentions of names, but we are experiencing right now, presently, currently in this United States, somebody that's been elevated to a position of authority that's not qualified. And here, Agar says when that happens, it disquiets the earth. And haven't we been in somewhat of a disquieted state in the United States for the last hundred and some odd days? That's all I got to say about that. Let's move to the next one. A fool when he is filled with meat. You know, it's a fool's the one who just, he hears God's word, but he doesn't apply it. And the idea here, in fact, let's move back to verse 9 because he says something about this back in verse 9. Listen carefully. He says back in verse 9, you know, and this is the prayer of Agar. He says, you know, don't, don't, you know, give me too much that I would be full and deny your name or steal 
and bring shame to your name. So what he's talking about here, and the second thing that disquiets is when, when, when we focus on things that are temporal and not eternal. A foolish person will set their ambitions, their affections, their desires, their pursuit on things that are temporal. Immediate satisfaction. And not things that are eternal. And there's nothing worse or more disquieting, he is saying, than a fool that is satisfied with the things of this life and has no desire or pursuit for things that are spiritual, for the life that is yet to come, for eternity, for any of those things things like that. In fact, we have a warning in the New Testament, and I love what John says. John says, love not the world. You understand that's written in an imperative? I think, especially today in our modern times, we're far too attached to the things of this world. We're far too satisfied. This is the thing that just quiets, he says. We're far too satisfied with the things of this world. As you study through church history and even go back into the Old Testament when God had to deal with the nation of Israel, it's an interesting thing that takes place. In fact, he warned them, and we warned you as we looked at verse 9 uh, last week, when they went into the land, he warned them and said, listen, be careful that when you go into the promised land, this land that I'm giving you, this land that flows with milk and honey, this land of prosperity, when you get into that land and you live in houses you didn't build, and you drink from wells you didn't dig. And you, listen, you eat from vineyards you didn't plant. Be careful, be warned, lest you be satisfied and you forget the Lord your God who brought you, you know, out of the land of Egypt to this promised land. And if you study the nation of Israel, it's from blessing to absolute cursing to blessing again. It doesn't seem like one generation after another can follow in the way they should go. God would bless a generation and they would be so full and they would focus on the physical, they would forget the Lord their God and then God would have to bring to them this humbling hand as he pulls his blessing back and as they struggle, then they cry out to the Lord and he blesses them and as soon as he blesses them, they forget. They forget. That's why Agar back in, you know, verses uh, 8, 9, and 10 says, listen, don't give me too much. Lest I forget you. Don't give me too little either. Lest I curse you. Just give me what I have need of. You know what? Listen. I am so satisfied with my life. You know. I, you guys know the kind of cars we drive. My Toyota pickup. You can't do this with a Jeep or a Chevy or a Ford. It's got 418,000 miles on it. When it rolls over 500, I'm riding Toyota. And I'm taking pictures of the odometer. And I'm sending that to them. That thing doesn't rattle, it doesn't squeak, it doesn't burn oil, it doesn't leak oil. It's, listen, it, my wife did, they had to drive it to go somewhere. She came back and said, don't ever get rid of this truck. This truck is so nice. And it has all of those, and I'm happy. I get in every time and say, Lord, all I have to do is anoint it with oil. Five and a half quarts and a new filter every once in a while. And this baby just keeps purring. Just keeps purring. Because, you know, it's not the things of this life that bring us contentment. They really don't. You think they do. They don't. That second law of thermodynamics is in play. Things go from a better state to a worse state. They always do in this life. You buy a brand new car. You think you can't live without it. Two years later, all the plastic pieces are falling off. Three years later, the things are starting to knock and rattle. I mean, you just... Things go from a better state to a worse. And he says one of the things that disquiets society is when people begin to focus on the things that are temporal and not the things that are eternal. The third thing he says, and it's interesting, an odious woman when she is married. Now, don't start thinking you know what the word odious means. It does not mean contentious. Although a contentious woman would disquiet things because there's other proverbs that talk about contentious women. It says it's better to live on top of your house than in your house with a contentious woman. But you know what? There's no contentious women in these churches, in this church at all. There, there are contentious women. I, I, I promise you there are contentious women in other churches. I've experienced them. But in this church, there are no contentious women. Not a one. Um, we have very... Loving and respectful and compliant and 
just gracious and merciful women in our church. Isn't that a gift from God that that's all we have here? But this word for odious means hated. Uh, the best way we can describe this is you remember um, the, 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 <laughs> the division that came between the two sisters, Rachel and Leah. You remember one was loved and one was hated. And the rivalry and the disquietness that took place in that family. And so he says one thing that can become disquieting. Because in those days they had multiple wives. I don't know why a man would ever think that he could handle more than one wife. In fact, that's why in the New Testament it says this. I'm convinced is why it says, you know, if you go to look for an elder, a wise man to help with the leadership of the church, you find a man that has one wife. And by the way, it doesn't talk about, that is not talking about divorce and remarriage. It's literally talking about one wife. One wife. Not two wives, not three wives. One wife. Because if you find a man that only has one wife, you have found a wise man. Because that man knows he can't, you know, we had an interesting thing happen. And, you know, we live in a Western society here. And we don't understand how the Bible's written because it's written from an Eastern mindset. There are things that go on in Eastern culture that are just not acceptable in the Western culture and vice versa. But we were on Bavuma Island out in Uganda in the Lake Victoria. And we were ministering. We were planting churches. And we were um, training pastors. And so we were... As we trained pastors during the day, then at night, they would take us. We had a couple of different pastors, and we'd go around to these unreached villages, villages that the gospel had never been preached in before. And we were preaching the gospel, and people were getting saved. And one night, I was on the other side of Bavuma Island. This man comes, and he gives his life to the Lord, and he says, you know, but I have a problem. And I said, well, the Lord will solve it. Don't worry about it. And he goes, no, no, I got a real problem. I have three wives. And I know in the Christian faith, you can only have one wife. I've heard you can only have one wife. What do I do? I don't have a clue, brother. I've ne Nobody's ever walked up to me after a church service and said, I'm going to get saved, but I got a problem. I got three wives. You'd be in jail for polygamy in this Western culture. But in the Eastern culture, he was a Muslim who had three wives. He gives his life to Christ. One of the wives that night gave her life to the Lord as well. We were there way past midnight praying for people, barely made it back to, to our camp. And so I said, I don't know, but the Lord will work it out. And so I asked one of the missionary pastors there, would you, would you follow up on this guy and let me know how it works out? Very interesting thing happened. The oldest wife got saved the same night he did, his first wife. The middle wife denounced him because he became an infidel as far as she was concerned. She took her dowry and went back home to her father. And of course, in, in that Islamic faith, he becomes a non-person, which means the marriage is null and void. It's like it never happened. She didn't have any children, so there wasn't a problem. And then the youngest wife was still in child-rearing years, and so he told her, because she wasn't saved yet, he told, she, the oldest wife told him, you make her your wife and just build me another hut beside our huts and I'll take care of the kids. I'll be the nanny. God worked it out. But can you imagine the tension that could have been there with three wives? You want to talk about something that disquiets? You, you have two women living under the same roof with one man as a husband and the one man shows more affection to one than the other. You've got a disquieted planet, man. And then the, the fourth thing, and he says, this is, this is beyond. It's, it's when a handmaid becomes heir to her mistress. And the idea here uh, in the Hebrew is that when the maid of the house has an affair with the husband. And it's almost like it's in the face of his wife. I can imagine some claws would come out and uh, there would be a little tension. And I guarantee you there would, it, <laughs> the earth would be disquieted. And so he's just making these particular observations, Agor is. L listen to what he says now as we come to verse 24. He says, there are four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. Uh, this guy obviously had a lot of time on his hands because he's just observing things. And he's 
making reference to these things. Now, notice the first thing he talks about is ants. He says, ants are a people not strong. I mean, when you were a kid, you remember finding an anthill and you just go there and stomp them or you get your magnifying glass and you burn them? Uh, he, he, this guy has never been to Africa, I can guarantee you, because those ants over there are not weak. We, 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 when we rolled up to Bavuma Island, we got off the boat, it was late at night, and we walked across the path of fire ants. And I'm going to tell you, you have to pull them off of you. They, you can't brush them off. They bite in and they sting like somebody's poking you with a hot poker. That's why they're called fire ants. But he's talking about your plain Jane ant. You know, your, your, the kind that come into your house in the summertime to get out of the weather. And if they find sugar, you can't get rid of them. This kind of ant. He said, the ants are a people not strong yet. Uh, they are... Um, they're wise, he's going to say, because they prepare their meat in the summer. Listen to the application he gives us. Ants work together in the summer to make sure they have enough for winter. They prepare. In fact, Jesus said, go to the ant. Study the ant, you sluggard. A wise person prepares. A wise person sets aside finances for difficult times. A wise person, listen, he prepares for the winter when it comes. He's not like the guy that says when, when it's raining, his roof is leaking. And he says, well, I can't fix it when it's raining and it doesn't need to be fixed when it's not. No, a wise person is one of those people that looks ahead and prepares. In fact, one of the Proverbs we studied as we came through the, you know, those number of chapters was that a wise man foresees danger or trouble or whatever, and he prepares for it. And so the takeaway from the ant is, listen, he, he may not be strong, but he's consistent. He may not be strong, but he continues at it. And he's always working in the summer to make sure he has enough for winter. He is always prepared. The second is the conies. Now, in Hebrew, it's interesting because this can mean a couple different things. You may have a footnote in your Bible that says badgers, like the rock badgers. It could be one of those. But it could also be one of these um, uh, Arabian mice. Uh, they're not really sure. It could either be one or the other. But I've kind of settled in on, as I've looked at this, uh, as, as a badger. He says, listen, the, the badger, they be a feeble folk. You know, they're kind of built low to the ground. And if you ever see them, it's, it's a rough living they have to make, man. Um, you know, they're a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. We were out in the, uh, Nevada one time. We took some of the youth out, um, Cody, Micah, some of the young boys, and we were just, you know, out exploring. We, we had our 22s, and Cody shot one of those things, and it ran into under a rock. He reached into that hole and drug that thing out by the tail, and that thing was screaming and going crazy, and then he had to shoot it again. I thought, what in the world were you thinking? But the takeaway from this is that the badgers are aware of danger and they prepare. They, they, they make their lodging in the rocks where other animals can't really dig them out. And so the ant is wise and he prepares for what's coming down the, down the road. The badger is wise because he builds his house in a fortified place. Listen carefully. Th then we have the locusts. You know, how many ever watched uh, Heldago? 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 Did I say that right? I just watched it the other night. What a great show. Uh, and I was envying the guy when the locusts came. Because in Africa, that's a delicacy. The ice cream truck comes by, but it's not ice cream. He's got the little bell and the wagon and all that, but he sells fried locusts. And the, our grandkids run out there to buy. And I'm going to tell you, when I was in, when I was in uh, South Korea, they served me these three-inch long fried locusts. They are the best. You know, they fried them in sesame seed oil, put a little salt on them. Man, I could eat them all day long. And they're just really good. But the locusts have no king. They have no king. Yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. And again, the takeaway on this is the locusts work together in unity. They don't have to be told what to do. Just many hands make light work, or many wings make 
great sound, and they just move. No king, no leader, but they work in unison to do what they do. And when they move through a place, there's nothing left. And so, again, without having to be prodded or, you know, derided or nagged at, you know, and, and have somebody bossing over you, these locusts just know what they need to do and they get it done. And then verse 28, and again, this is another one of those words in the Hebrew that can go either way. Um, your, your Bible, my Bible says spider. How many people say spider? How many say gecko? Because it could be either one. It could be a lizard. Isn't that interesting? Some of these Hebrew words are hard to translate. Um, because, again, a gecko, by his hands, would take hold of the king's palace, but so would a spider with her spider webs. But since old King James says spider, we'll use that as the analogy, but it still works the same. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in the king's palace. If you work hard, if you have a good work ethic is the idea, then you will succeed, just like the spider in the king's palace. Now, this guy must have been just observant. I don't know. Some of us can just go through life and we never even watch an ant. Who's ever looked at locusts or watched a spider or a gecko? Well, I've watched a lot of geckos in Africa walk across the walls. Hey, here again, verse 29. There are three things which go well. Yea, Four are graceful or stately in their going. Uh, they walk with that. What do they call that in Texas? Uh, it's not a strut. It's a swagger. Swagger. You know, so he's saying, man, there are three things um, here that, that have a swagger. And the fourth man, uh, when, when, when this guy moves, it's with confidence. It's stately. It's gracious. Listen carefully. And of course, I've seen this. A lion, which is the strongest of the beasts. You know, we've been in Africa, and how many have ever had to have somebody guard you while you change a tire? I have. We were in Kadepo, which is right on the Sudanese border, uh, north of Uganda, and this particular, um, you know, safari game ranch opened up. And so... Before Doug and Destiny left Africa, we wanted to make a trip over there. And after we'd done ministry, we wanted to spend a few days in Kadepo because there's a lot of lions. They still have rhinos up there. Giraffes are thick. And so we went up there and we spent a few days. And the lions, we, we drove right up to a pride that had just killed that evening. And they were finishing it up that morning. And they were laying there. You don't get out of the car. You just kind of watch. But then you'll see the, the male lion, he'll just kind of strut over there. And he'll pick up whatever he wants. The females do all the work. Did you know that? They do the kill, and then the male just kind of struts over there and gets what he wants. I've seen this. He's got the swagger going on, man. And, and if he'll, he'll, he'll even bark a little bit at him like that, and they just fall right into line. So the lion with his swagger. The greyhound. The lion with his strength. The greyhound with his speed. You ever watch these greyhound races? It is amazing how fast these dogs are and how graceful they are when they run. The greyhound, you know, when he runs. And then he says the goat. I had to look up why the goat was in here. Because we don't, we don't, listen, we used to raise goats when I was a kid. You know, goats are not seen as something that is majestic. But do you know sheep will follow goats? And there's something about a goat that thinks he's the master of his environment. I mean, you watch him, he's like, there's nothing better than me. And we, <laughs> we had a trailer with a bunch of gravel on it when I was a kid. We had a five-acre farm. And that goat would stand on that. And so when we kids would come home, we would play drag the billy off of the mound. And he would fight us. And then after, you know, we'd drag him off, he'd jump back up there. And we went on for hours. The only problem with that, have you ever smelled a billy goat? My mom would not let me in the house. I had to take all my clothes off out in the garage before I could come in the house because I'd be wrestling with that billy goat. But there's something very majestic about a goat, whether you know it or not. Not the old goats like the men in the church, but I'm talking about the real goats. <laughs> something very majestic. And then he says, listen, and a king against whom? A king against there is no rising up. One who rules with such authority and with such... Loyalty of his subjects. Um, 
that nobody would, would rival him. We have such a king. Amen. I mean, think about it. Who could rival the king of glory? The king of righteousness. The king of kings and lord of lords. He moves with grace and, and confidence because his word is without contestation. That's our king. Amen? And so, Agur is making note of that. And then he says this. And I like how he ends his section. Good advice for all of us. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself. And the idea is in pride. Because back in chapter 13, verse 10, we find out that only by pride comes contention. So if you've been proud, and through your pride, you have lifted yourself up, and there's been contention because of your pride. Then here's what Agur says you ought to do. Or if you have had evil thoughts because of your pride, there's tension, there's strife between you and a brother, he says, then what you need to do is just lay your hand over your mouth. You need to shut up. Amen? You know, Kyle posted something the other day, my wife, that, you know, don't open your mouth in anger because nothing good will come of it. If your heart is upset, take your heart to the Lord before you open your mouth. You know, over the years as a pastor, we've been accused of everything. I mean, that's just what people do. And we understand it. You know, sheep bite. But what we have just had to learn to do is just shut our mouths, let the Lord defend us. Where there's no wood, the fire goes out. Just keep moving in the direction you're supposed to go. And if you've gotten caught up in that, and it's easy to do, because every one of us, think with me this evening, every one of you want to defend yourself, don't you? How many, when you're accused of something or, or somebody's being mean, do, how many want to defend yourself? You just raise your hand. No, seriously. How many have defended themselves? Let me tell you this. I love what Chuck Smith used to say. He used to say it to these in our pastor's conference. He said, listen, you guys are going to be accused of all kinds of stuff. You're never, listen, you're never going to please everybody. There's always going to be, a, in fact, he said, if you could have 20% of the church behind you at any given time, you're doing good. I go, really? I mean, he freaked me out in the early days, like 20%. You mean there's going to be 80% with pitchforks and, and, you know, and torches wanting to come and get you? He says, yeah, that's what happens in the ministry. Don't worry about it. He said, you can defend yourself if you want. And God will let you if you choose to do it. But it's better just to put your hand over your mouth and let him defend you. He does a much better job. And then he used to always tell us, and he would have that laugh. I miss Chuck. He had that laugh that he would always say, because those who sling mud lose ground. Think about it. He would laugh at his own jokes. They that sling mud lose ground. <laughs> and it's true. Just if you've gotten caught up in that, let the Lord defend you. Put your hand over your mouth. Lamp down on the cage God gave you for your tongue. You know, I had one guy that just became my nemesis for a long time at the last church I passed. And finally I went to him and I said, you know, what is the deal? Well, I think you're this, 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 and this, and this. I had a lady do the same thing. I don't know what it was about that place. But, you know, and I said, you know what? I could give you a much worse list if you're looking to accuse me of things. Why don't you pray with me? Oh, I don't want to pray with you. No, you just want to accuse. God will deal with you if you're that way. Always find the good in people, not the bad. And if somehow your heart's been wounded, keep your mouth shut until your heart's right. And then go to your brother and try to restore it. And go to him and him alone and try to fix it. Amen? So I think Agar ends pretty well because then he goes on to say, man, this guy observes some things. Surely the churning of milk brings forth butter. Now, none of us know anything about that, but I actually have churned butter. And... Uh, you know, my grandfather and grandmother grew up on a farm in Arkansas, and they still had a butter churn. And I didn't do it for very long because it's not fun. 
And it's not like cranking the old ice cream, because we used to do that every Sunday night. Because at the end of cranking the ice cream, you get ice cream. You can't just reach into butter and eat it. So as the churning of milk produces butter, listen, and the wringing of the nose brings forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. Let it go. But they accused me. Let it go. But they hurt my feelings. Let it go. But they offended me. Let it. They falsely. Let it go. Let it go. Put your hand over your mouth. Stop throwing wood on the fire. It'll go out. Be the more mature one. Be the more godly one. Be the more righteous one. Why do I say the more godly one? When Jesus was falsely accused and he was standing before Pilate, what did he do? He opened not his mouth to defend himself. Here's the deal, gang. Listen, guys and gals. The people who love you, that really know you, they would never accuse you. They know you. The people who would accuse you don't know you, and it doesn't matter what they think. Amen? The only person that matters is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're okay with him, then don't worry about anybody else. Do not defend yourself. Just let it go. Let those people who have picked up the ministry of the accuser of the brethren do their thing. Let God deal with them. You stay out of it. And if somehow they've incited you, where now you begin to get involved with it, here Agler would say, just put your hand over your mouth and shut up. Because churning butter and wringing of the nose as it brings forth blood, if you get involved, it's only going to bring wrath and strife. Just stop it. Be the mature one and just stop it. And let the Lord deal with it. Amen? Chapter 31. We're going to go through the first nine verses. And the next week we get the Proverbs 31 woman. The words of King Elmuel. Now listen. Um, I, there is no king by this name. Anywhere in Scripture. Uh, a lot of uh, the commentators have taken a stab at it. Um, Muel, some say, well, it's Muel, one of the pagan kings that had a kingdom not far away. But why would he be given this kind of wisdom? He wouldn't. Um, others have said, and I believe this is probably the closest thing we're going to get to, is this is Solomon. King Solomon who's using, uh, uh, what would you call that when you don't, uh, uh, alias? Yeah, he's using an alias. And I think there's a reason why he's using an alias. Because the very things he's going to warn us about in these verses he fell into. And maybe he's a little embarrassed. But he wants to warn us. And I think it's right that if you've fallen into a trap, warn people. Tell them, man, don't touch that, it's hot. See this scar? I'm telling you, that's hot and it will hurt you. Don't touch it. Let others learn from your lessons and, and be gracious and be humble enough to say, I messed up. I didn't listen. I fell into that trap. And this is what it cost me. God was faithful. He drug me out. But listen, don't go near that. Amen? Amen? So we ought to warn each other. Um, and, and don't stand over there where there's a pit and just say, I didn't know there was a pit there when you got dust all over you from falling in the pit because you're too proud to admit you fell in the pit that you would warn somebody else of the pit. You get what I'm saying here? Okay, listen to what he says here. The words of King Emuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. This would be Bathsheba, David's wife. David, the father of Solomon, his wife Bathsheba, begins to teach Solomon some lessons, which means he was taught these lessons by his mother at a very early age. God gave him supernatural wisdom. And all through the book of Proverbs, it's interesting as we're coming to the last section here uh, where Solomon is writing, all through the Proverbs, he warns us of the very things that his mother taught him. That the Holy Spirit, when it came upon him and that wisdom, instructed him. But at the end of his life, he failed in every one of those areas. I believe God restored him, but he simply fell in those areas. Now listen to what he says. Now, this is interesting. Because the what actually means, listen up. Listen up, my son. And listen up, the son of my womb. 
And listen up, the son of my vows. Very interesting that as she's addressing Lemuel, which I believe to be Solomon, she's making three comments of the relationship she has with him. You are my son. You're the son of my womb. You're my natural born son. Not son by adoption. You're my son, but you're the son that I gave birth to. But you're also the son of my vow. That has an association with you promising God something if he will give you a child. Because you remember the first child died. You remember as David sent for Bathsheba when he saw her bathing on the housetop when he should have been at war. Out with his troops. And he brings her to himself and he lies with her in a biblical sense, and she becomes pregnant. Then he tries to deceive her husband, Uriah, by bringing him off the battlefield and having a sleep with his wife that he could blame it on her, and he was too honorable man to do that. He even got him drunk, and he still wouldn't do that. So he puts a letter in his hand and sends him back, and he gives the letter to his commander, and, and, and the letter says, put Uriah in the very front, pull back close enough where the arrows can hit him, and he had him murdered. David had hid this for two years till the prophet shows up and says, you're the man. But David still does the honorable thing and he marries Bathsheba. And maybe because of that whole scenario, she makes a vow to God. God, if you will give me a son, I promise you I will raise him in the ways he should go. I will raise him godly and righteous. I will bring him up in your word. He's the son of her vow. So she is investing in him just like Timothy's grandma and mother invested in him. So this woman is investing in this person. And she says, you're my son, you're my son by birth, and listen, you're the son of my vow. First thing I want to tell you, Solomon, is give not thy strength, your energy, your desire, your time, your ambition, your pursuit. Give not your strength unto women. Listen, there's a time and place for those kind of things. Some men, listen, it's, it's like every thought is a sexual thought. Every pursuit is a romantic pursuit. And she's saying to him, listen, Wives are good things. Romance is a good thing. But don't give all of yourself to that. There are other things that are important. And so be careful that you don't become a whoremonger. It's an Old Testament word. For someone who, listen, every moment of the day, they, it's sex on the brain. Men, listen, there's other things that are important. Your, your spiritual pursuit. Relational with your wife as your friend, as your companion in life. There are things that are far more important that you develop than just a sexual relationship. And so his mother's warning him, be careful. Because, you know, pretty soon, Solomon, all these hormones are going to be popping out. And you're going to start noticing that girls don't stink anymore. They don't have cooties, but actually smell pretty good. And their skin is soft. When you discover that, don't make that your sole pursuit. Don't give your strength to them. Then he says, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. He says, because if you don't control those sexual desires, that those immoral thoughts, they'll destroy you. And we know that it did. Uh, we read in 1 Kings chapter 11, you remember all of the Proverbs we read through in the, in the first nine chapters where he's warning his son Solomon is, beware of women, beware of this, beware of that, beware of adultery, be, and sexual sin. He warns him profusely as we walk through the first nine chapters of Proverbs, and yet we read as he gets later in life in 1 Kings 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 4, for it came to pass, and isn't this sad? Here's a man who God gave divine wisdom to, who warns his son in his early years, but it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives, he was told not to multiply his wives, and he did. And he didn't just multiply godly wives. He took wives from Egypt. He took wives that did not serve or know the Lord. And his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David, his father. David repented. Isn't that interesting that God says his heart's right now? 
that Solomon gave himself over. So the warning is be careful. Immorality will destroy you. Be careful. And then she goes on to say in verse 4, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. It clouds your judgment. How many marriages, how many lives, how many families have been destroyed by alcohol? How many people, my wife just posted a thing in Wyoming where this young family was moving, just got the dream job and sold their house, was moving to a whole new life. And a drunk driver, head on, it's the husband and one of the children in the front. And the wife watched with the other kids in the back on the second car, watched him all, almost, he's in critical condition. When you look up the stats in America for how people die, do you know the lowest death rate this year was COVID-19? Only 35,000 people in the United States died of COVID-19. It's almost 10 times that people dry, died from drunk drivers running into them. Children abused. There is nothing good about drunkenness. It's a sin. Now, I can't tell you having a glass of wine with your dinner is a sin because the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, we're going to see in a few moments, it does recommend having a glass of wine in certain situations. But certainly Luke told Paul to tell Timothy when he had stomach problems, it was medicinal. And that's what it should be used for. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your off-time infirmities. Because red wine, not white wine, has 35 different effects on your body and they're all good. Lowers cholesterol, lowers blood pressure, does a lot of good things. Vascular system, helps you digest food. My mom, was 16 years old, had a third of her stomach removed. She had some intestinal problems. So she lived her whole life with only two-thirds of her stomach, so she didn't digest food real well. And for her entire life, and I can remember this as a kid, she had to take like a shot glass full of red wine before every meal. The doctor told her, we can give you pills to help you do that, but they have all kinds of side effects. Just drink. And she hated the taste of it. She hated the smell of it. She would take it like you would take medicine, plug her nose, and down it would go. And I hated the smell of it, you know, because you'd always have to have that because it helped her stomach. But here he's saying, listen, it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice or the judgment of those that are afflicted. But you can give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. You get somebody that's in the hospice situation and maybe, see, in those days they didn't have the diagnostic techniques that we do. There could be people like my mom when she died of cancer. Um, the last few months of her life, they just gave her morphine, liquid morphine to pour in her coffee, to pour in her iced tea because she, her, the cancer metastasized in her spine, went up into her brain, which the doctors told us is the most painful way to die. Just ease their suffering. To those that are ready to die, give them strong drink. Ease their suffering. Or he says to those that have a heavy heart, you know, somebody who just had a tragedy take place in their life, and they're just overwhelmed with that, and they're just at their wits' end, and, and they're, they're coming unglued. He said, give them a little strong drink to calm them down. It's medicinal. But if you're just drinking, recreationally drinking, to be drunk, not wise. Listen to what uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 10, this is Solomon writing, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. He says, woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child. Man, woe to our land, huh? Um, didn't mention any names, so don't kick me off Facebook or, or, or YouTube. Woe to thee, O land, when your king is a child. And thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles. And thy princes eat in due season. They eat what they need. They're not gluttons. For strength and not for drunkenness. They're sober-minded people. And so she's warning him. And no doubt she's warning him about kings because he will someday become a king. That's why I believe it's 
Solomon here that she's speaking to, and it's Bathsheba that's writing. Uh, listen to what she says as we move down into um, verse 8. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the case of all such that are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and of the needy. A good king will do that. I think we had one of the greatest presidents. I, I got the privilege of living during the time of Reagan. I got the horrible displeasure of living during the time of Carter. How many remember those days uh, when the economy tanked? It's hard to get a job. I worked, actually, as I was going to college during that time, I, I was working some summers for my dad. Luckily, I had a decent job, but my friends weren't able to find work. And some of them were, weren't able to go back and finish up college because there were just no jobs. You remember the gas lines, out of gas? And the privilege after that of, of living during a time when Reagan and Reaganomics brought our economy back. Very wise man. A man of the people. A man who said, listen, you ought to worry when the government says I'm here to help. He, he always thought there should be less government and more of the wealth should stay to you. And the government was there to assist you in that. And then we worked through some other years, and we finally came again to Trump, which I think was a very wise man when it came to economics. Um, you know that Trump has never tasted alcohol in his entire life. His older brother wasted his life doing it. He hates it. Do you know he sleeps four or five hours a day? That's it. Because he has a strong work ethic. And although he is a billionaire, do you know there are stories, multiple stories of how he would stop his limousine to help somebody change a tire or he paid someone's house or paid their college suite. I mean, he's always giving. That's the kind of person that the land rejoices when you have that kind of person in leadership. Because the job of a king is to open his mouth to defend the weak, to defend the hurting, to promote those people that need help. Uh, one last verse, and we'll close out tonight because we'll finish the rest of Proverbs uh, next week. But Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17 says this. And we ought to be those kind of people. We ought to be those kind of people. We defend the weak. We don't take advantage of them. We help the widow in her need. Um, you know, we have a benevolence fund here, and we let the widows know, listen, we're here to help. We've helped a lot. But here's what it says, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do well. Um, in the New Testament, it says, be others-centered. Let, let not every man look on his own things, but also on the things of others. Be others-centered. And here Isaiah chimes in with the very words that Bathsheba tells her son Solomon before he's a king. When you get into that position where you have the authority and the power and the right to help people, you make sure you open your mouth to defend them. You open your mouth to protect them. You make sure that you, you reign as a king. There is a quietness in the kingdom because you as a majestic king, you rule in righteousness. Learn to do well. Seek justice or do what is right. Learn to do well. Seek that which is right. Relieve the oppressed. Help them out. Judge the fatherless. And the word for judge there means Judge a righteous judgment and the fact where you roll up your sleeves and you get involved with the fatherless and plead for the widow. These are things that delight the heart of the father. We Christians ought to be the most compassionate people on the planet. Amen. Because if you do, you do well.